Okay. Now this is kind of a special way of doing the suttas because I'm going to be using two separate uh, suttas. You'll get to see in a minute. This is called the Datu Vibhanga Sutta, Sutta number 140, the exposition of the elements. <coughs> Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was wandering in the Magadhan country and eventually arrived at Rajagaha. There he went to the potter Bhagawa and asked him, If it's not inconvenient for you, Bhagawa, I will stay one night in your workshop. It is not inconvenient for me, venerable sir, but there is a homeless one already staying there. If he agrees, then stay as long as you like, venerable sir. Now, there was a clansman named Pukusati who had gone forth from the home life into homelessness out of faith in the Blessed One. And on that occasion, he was already staying in the potter's workshop. Then the Blessed One went to the Venerable Pukusati and said to him, If it's not inconvenient for you, monk, I will stay one night in the workshop. The potter's workshop is large enough, friend. Let the Venerable One stay as long as he likes. Then the Blessed One entered the potter's workshop prepared a spread of grass at one end, sat down, folding his legs, setting his body erect and establishing mindfulness in front of him. Then the Blessed One spent most of the night seated in meditation, and the Venerable Pukusati also spent most of the night seated in meditation. Then the Blessed One thought, this clansman conducts himself in a way that inspires confidence. Suppose I were to question him. So he asked the Venerable Pukusati, Under whom have you gone forth, monk? Who is your teacher? Whose Dhamma do you profess? Friend, there is the recluse Gotama, the son of the Sakyans who went forth from the Sakyan clan. Now a good report of that blessed Gotama has been spread to this effect. That the blessed one is accomplished, fully awakened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, awakened and blessed. I have gone forth under the Blessed One. That Blessed One is my teacher. I profess the Dhamma of that Blessed One. But monk, where is that Blessed One, accomplished and fully awakened, now living? There is, friend, a city in the northern country named Sawati. The Blessed One, accomplished and fully awakened, is now living there. But, monk, have you ever seen that Blessed One before? Would you recognize him if you saw him? 
No, friend, I've never seen that blessed one before, nor would I recognize him if I saw him. Then the blessed one thought, this clansman has gone forth from the home life into homelessness under me. Suppose I were to teach him the Dhamma. So the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Pukusati thus, Monk, I will teach you the Dhamma. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the Venerable Pukusati replied, the Blessed One said this, Monk, this person consists of six elements, six bases of contact, 18 kinds of mental exploration, and he has four foundations. The tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands on these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no, la no longer sweep over him, he's called a sage at peace. One should not neglect wisdom, should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment. This means letting go of craving. And should train for peace. This is a summary of the exploration of the six elements. Monk, this person consists of six elements, so it was said, and with reference to what was this said. There are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. So it was with reference to this that it was said, monks, this person consists of six elements. Monk, this person consists of six bases of contact, so it was said, and with reference to what was this said, there are the base of the eye contact, the base of ear contact, the base of nose contact, the base of tongue contact, the base of body contact, and the base of mind contact. So it was with reference to this that it was said, monk, this person consists of six bases of contact. Monk, this person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said? On seeing a form with the eye, one explores a form productive of joy. One explores a form productive of grief. One explores a form productive of equanimity. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with mind, one explores one of these sense doors productive of joy. One explores one of these sense doors productive of grief. One explores one of these sense doors productive of equanimity. So it was with reference to this that it was said, monks, this person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration. 
Monk, this person has four foundations, so it was said, and with reference to what was this said. And these are four different kinds of foundation. There are the foundation of wisdom. The foundation of wisdom is seeing how the links of dependent origination work and seeing the impersonal nature of everything. Okay? The foundation of truth. The foundation of relinquishment. This means letting go of craving. Six R's. And the foundation of peace. So it was with reference to this that it was said, Monk, this person has four foundations. One should not neglect wisdom. One should preserve truth. Should cultivate relinquishment. Use the six R's and should train for peace. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, how, monk, does one not neglect wisdom? Here, there are six elements. The earth element, water element, fire element, air element, space element, and consciousness element. What, monk, is the earth element? The earth element may be either internal or external. What is the internal earth element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, craved and clung to. That is, head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinew, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, contents of the stomach, feces, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, craved, and clung to. This is called the internal earth element. Now both the internal earth element and the external earth element are simply earth element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the earth element and allows the mind to be dispassionate towards the earth element. <coughs> Now, we're going to another, another sutta, and this is the advice that the Buddha was giving to his son, Rahula. Rahula, develop meditation that is like the earth. For when you develop meditation that is like the earth, a risen agreeable and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind and remain. That's a real strong statement. Not invade your mind and remain. I use a few different words for that. Don't make a big deal out of anything whether it's agreeable or disagreeable, it doesn't matter. You make a big deal out of something that's agreeable, you're going to start thinking about it. And you're going to be away from your object of meditation. 
What's the point of being with an, a meditation if you're not with the object? So, you're going to hear this statement fairly often. I want you to really appreciate it and understand deeply. Don't let things invade your mind and remain. How many times do you have repeat thoughts about anything? Anybody that has repeat thoughts has what? Craving in it. And they're causing themselves suffering. And that causes to frustration, anxiety, depression, whatever. Because you make a big deal out of whatever arises, a feeling. When a painful feeling arises, what do you do with it? First thing you do is, I don't like it. Oh, I'm attached right now. Then, you have clinging arise. What is clinging? Clinging is all of your, your thoughts, your opinions, your ideas, your story about. And your deep attachment to that feeling and that story. And then you have what I call a habitual emotional tendency. Now you're made up of five things, right? You have a physical body, you have feeling, you have perception, those two are always conjoined, always. You have thoughts, you have consciousness. When you have a painful feeling arise and you start to make a story about it, then you start to try to control the feeling with thoughts. And that doesn't work. And that causes frustration, it causes anxiety, it causes all kinds of suffering. And you're taking it all very personally. This is where your emotions really get out of hand. This is where you suffer a lot. And the, then there is the birth of action. And then sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair arise. And you're doing it all to yourself. Why? because you let it invade your mind and remain. You try to think you can control these things and you try to control the feeling with your thoughts. Well, I'll tell you a little secret. The more you think about a feeling, the bigger and more intense that feeling becomes. Then you get more and more emotionally attached to it. And you cause yourself immeasurable amounts of suffering. And you can't blame anybody else for your suffering. Because you're doing it to yourself, right? Well, don't do that. Right? Easy. When you start practicing the six R's and you learn how to smile more and have a lighter mind and you start to laugh with yourself because your mind is crazy, it does all kinds of weird things and becomes attached, When you can laugh with that, 
that changes your perspective right then, right there. The easiest way to let go of suffering is to laugh with yourself. I'll tell you how I discovered that. I lived in Hawaii for a while. And there was a, a man that was, he was building a house. And he was doing it all by himself. So I said, okay, I'll help you do this. Well, I can't pay you. I don't want any pay. I just want to help. No problem. After a couple of weeks, he started thinking he was my boss. And he, he said something that really got me pretty angry. Right at the end of the day, and I started walking up to my truck. And as I was walking, I was noticing I was digging my heels into the ground. And I'm thinking all of these nasty thoughts about this yo-yo that thought he was my boss and I'm helping him for free. And then I had a thought. And it dawned on me that he really did think he was my boss. And at that time, it made me laugh. And when I laughed, all of a sudden, I wasn't angry anymore. I went from, I'm mad and I don't like it, to, well, there's some anger there. Is that mine? No, I didn't ask it to come up. Do I want to carry this anger around with me for the rest of the day? No, let it go. It's not that important. So it changes your perspective from I am that and I don't like that to, well, it's only this anger. It's only this dislike. It's only whatever it is. Okay, but it's impersonal, isn't it? I didn't ask that anger to come up. It came up because conditions were right for it to come up. Now, what am I going to do with that when it arises? Laugh. I told you yesterday, we got to laugh more. We have to laugh at how incredibly stupid stupid our minds can be. Every time you get serious with something, every time you have a repeat thought, I am there. I am causing myself more and more sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And you can't blame anybody else because you're doing it to yourself. So when you laugh, that takes that hindrance and just changes the perspective of the whole thing. Now it's easy to let go of that. So the more you laugh with yourself, you ever have one of those kind of days that nothing went right? Everything you try to do is difficult and the, oh man, this is a really rough day. I used to have days like that. I don't anymore, but I used to. And there was a song that was out of the 60s and Every time I had a day like that, I would remind myself this song. Mama said there'd be days like this. <laughs> and as soon as I, I, I sang that to myself, all of a sudden, I wasn't upset because it was one of those kind of days. And what happened in my mind? It changed my perspective and I became super efficient. What I put 
put aside time it's going to take a half an hour to do that. I did it in two minutes. And I got done with everything that I needed to get done for the whole day and I still had time left over. Developing your sense of humor about yourself is really, really important. And life is more fun. Now also, it is the keeping of your precepts that helps this to develop. It's not a baby. It really does work this way. Okay. Rahula, develop meditation that is like the earth. For when you develop meditation that is like the earth, a risen agreeable and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind and remain. Just as people throw clean things and dirty things, excrement, urine, spittle, pus, and blood on the earth, the earth is not repelled and disgusted because of that. So too Rahula develop meditation that is like the earth. For when you develop meditation that is like the earth, a risen agreeable and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind and remain. Sounds like good advice to me. You? Okay. Okay. What monk is the water element? The water element may be either internal or external. What is the internal water element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is water, watery, craved, and clung to. That is bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, urine or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is water, watery, craved, and clung to. That is called the internal water element. Now, both the internal water element and the external water element are simply water element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the water element and allows the mind to be dispassionate towards the water element. Now, one of the things that when I was in, I, I lived in Malaysia for some years, and I had a lot of college students. They were 19, 20, 21 years old. And the thing with the uh, going to college in Malaysia is they only give you one test a year. You either pass or you fail. So that put a lot of pressure on, on these young kids. They were Chinese. Chinese by nature are uh, very ambitious. They want to get good grades. So about a week before they had their test, or two weeks, 
they would come and I would give them a retreat. Now one of the problems they had when they came was they were 18, 19, 20 years old, 21 years old, and their hormones were really starting to flash up and they had a lot of lustful thinking in their mind. Or they would see some a, a beautiful body walk by and then they, all of a sudden they're, they're lost in this world of lust, of thinking about. And they ask me, how, how can I put my mind in balance when this comes up? So I didn't read this kind of sutta to them. I told them, it's real simple. Turn their body inside out. Tell me how beautiful it is. Oh, you have wonderful smelling pus. <laughs> I've never seen such a beautiful set of intestines. And the more that they thought like that, they started losing their interest in the lust that put their, their mind in balance. So what I basically told them, I taught them a lot of different kinds of lessons, but one of the biggest problems they had was their worry about being able to pass the test. So they had to study a lot. And they would pick up a book and they would start reading the book and then they would have some kind of worry or anxiety about, oh, what's my mother going to think or my father if I don't pass this test? And they were very worried about it. So I told them, you understand what restlessness is, that's what you get attacked by. So instead of getting caught up in your worry while you're trying to read something in the book, put the book down. Use the six R's, come back to, your, to wishing yourself happiness. Five minutes then their mind would settle down and they became efficient with what they were reading. They, did, they didn't have to go over it and over it and over it to get it. And they were all real successful with taking their, their tests and they passed quite nicely after I taught them these simple little things. I told them, don't study the night before the test. Go to bed. And I had taught them how to use their intuition. So if they didn't know an answer right off, ask what the, how, to, how to solve this problem or whatever it happened to be, and go to another question, and then come back to this one and answer it. They did quite well. Then they graduated. And they said, now we have to go get jobs. What do I do to get a job? And I said, you already know the answer. Smile. And when you go in to talk to them about getting a job, you interview them to see if you want to work there. And they were real successful. They were really happy. The smile, she, they, they came back and told me, you know, the smiling is really amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on, guys. Of course it's success you're successful when you smile. Who likes to see a, frown a frowning face? Smile, be happy, interview them to see if you want that job or not. They like people that take control. They like people that are ambitious enough to ask good questions. 
So it was a real interesting experience. So, Rahula, develop meditation that is like water. For when you develop meditation that is like water, a risen, agreeable and disagreeable context will not invade your mind and remain. Let your mind be like water. There's a stream and the water goes down the stream. What happens when it hits a rock? Does it try to push it out of the way? Does it get angry with it? Does it try to force that rock to move? No, it just goes around it. Let your mind be like water. Don't hang on to hindrances. Don't make a big deal out of it. Let your mind be like water. Yeah, you're going to have hindrances arise. Welcome to the real world. But just let your mind go around it. Don't make it a big deal. Relax into it. Just as people wash clean things and dirty things, excrement, urine, spittle, pus, and blood in water, and the water is not repelled and disgusted because of that, so too Rahula develop meditation that is like water. For when you develop meditation that is like water, a risen agreeable and disagreeable context will not invade your mind and remain. Don't let these things invade your mind and remain. Stop making a big deal out of a memory or a, a hindrance or whatever, a pain. Don't let it invade your mind and remain. Let it be there by itself. Use the six R's and come back to your object to meditation. It's simple. In India, they, they used to complain to me. It can't be that simple. Why? Well, it's got to be much more complicated than that. I said, well, you, you stay here for a couple of days and you'll see how simple it is and how easy it can be. Don't add anything, don't subtract anything, just simply use the six R's with your distraction. Okay. What monk is the fire element? The fire element may be either internal or external. What is the internal fire element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery, fiery craved and clung to. That is, that by which one is warmed, ages, and is consumed, and that by which what is eaten, drunk, consumed, and tasted gets completely digested, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery, craved and clung to. This is called the internal fire element. Now both the internal fire element and the external fire element are simply fire element. <laughs> and that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the fire element 
and allows the mind to be dispassionate towards the fire element. Rahula. Develop meditation that is like fire. For when you develop meditation that is like fire, a risen agreeable and disagreeable context will not invade your mind and remain. Just as people burn clean things and dirty things, excrement, urine, spittle, pus, and blood in fire, and the fire is not repelled and disgusted because of that. So too, Rahula, develop meditation that is like fire. For when you develop meditation that is like fire, a risen agreeable and disagreeable context will not invade your mind and remain. Now you're starting to get the idea, don't make a big deal out of anything. I don't care if it's a painful feeling. I don't care if it's a painful emotion. It's not yours. Did you ask it to come up? Did you say, you know, I haven't had this really painful feeling for a long time. I think it's time for it to arise. Nobody's that dumb. So why do you take it personally? Why do you try to control it? Why do you try to make it be the way you want it to be? Relax. Use your six R's. Smile. Have fun. Laugh with yourself for taking things personally. Got to develop your sense of humor more. And you know, the, the magic of doing this practice is your sense of humor starts to change. You stop laughing at things. You start laughing with things. I saw some turkeys there a little while ago. And it made me smile, it made me happy. I love turkeys. These kind of things uplift your mind. You truly appreciate nature. And you'll start laughing with how animals act with each other. We have dogs and cats. And they, they, they play and they have all kinds of fun. Makes me laugh. It's fun being around them. That's why we have them. What monk is the air element? The air element may be internal or external. What is the internal air element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is air airy, craved and clung to. That is, upgoing winds, downgoing winds, winds in the, in the belly, winds in the bowels, winds that course through the limbs, in breath and out breath, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is air, airy, craved and clung to. That is called the internal air element. Now both the internal air element and the external air element are simply air element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the air element. 
and allows the mind to be dispassionate towards the air element. The air element is real interesting because it's movement and vibration. The movement and vibration I tell you, you have to sit still, can you? Hmm? Can you sit without moving? Not hardly. Your blood's moving around. Molecules and atoms are moving around all over the place. The earth is spinning. The galaxy is spinning. The universe is spinning. How can you sit still? Doesn't mean anything, really. I just like to make that make that. <laughs> <laughs> but it is an interesting concept. Okay. There. Rahula, develop meditation that is like air. For when you develop meditation that is like air, a risen agreeable and disagreeable context will not invade your mind and remain. Just as the air blows on clean things and dirty things, on excrement, urine, spittle, pus, and blood, and, and the air is not repelled and disgusted because of that. So too Rahula develop meditation that is like the air. For when you develop meditation that is like the air, a risen agreeable and disagreeable context will not invade your mind and remain. What monk is the space element? The space element may be either internal or external. What is the internal space element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is space, spatial, graved and clung to. That is the holes of the ears, the nostrils, excuse me, the door of the mouth and that aperture whereby what is eaten, drunk, consumed, and tasted gets swallowed and where it collects and where it is excreted from below or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is space, spatial, craved, and clung to. This is called the internal space element. Now, both the internal space element and external space element are simply space element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the space element and allows the mind to be dispassionate towards the space element. Rahula, develop meditation that is like space. For when you develop meditation that is like space, arisen, agreeable, and disagreeable context will not invade your mind and remain. Just as space is not established anywhere. Now here we're talking about getting into the Arupa Jhanas. You don't have a body anymore. 
Now you're in a mental realm. So to Rahula, develop meditation that is like space. For when you develop meditation that is like space, arisen agreeable and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind and remain. Rahula, develop meditation on loving kindness. For when you develop meditation on loving kindness, any ill will will be abandoned. Rahula, develop meditation on compassion. For when you develop meditation on compassion, any cruelty will be abandoned. Rahula, develop meditation on joy. For when you develop meditation on joy, any discontent will be abandoned. Rahula, develop meditation on equanimity. For when you develop meditation on equanimity, any aversion will be abandoned. So you know, now you know the importance of what I'm showing you by getting into the Brahma Viharas. That will help change your whole perspective of things. So you can be more happy all the time. <clears throat> then there remains only consciousness purified and bright what does one cognize with that consciousness one cognizes this is pleasant one cognizes this is painful one cognizes this is neither painful nor pleasant. Independence on a contact to be felt as pleasant, there arises a pleasant feeling. When one feels a pleasant feeling, one understands I feel a pleasant feeling. One understands with the cessation of that same contact to be felt as pleasant, its corresponding feeling, the pleasant feeling that arose in dependence on that contact, to be felt as pleasant, ceases and subsides. So it's going to be there for a while, it's going to disappear. That's the nature of everything. Everything is in a state of change. But the more you develop your equanimity, the more you develop your balance, you don't get knocked off balance so easy. You still go through your ups and downs, but they're not as radical. Now, I was, I was with somebody, and I, I, I live in a very small town. I don't live in the town, I live 12 miles from the town. But I was in town and somebody gave me a phone call and they said, we just had a tornado go through the property and they were real excited. And they said, oh, the buildings are blown down and there's all kinds of problems and the trees were, uh, the, all the trees are gone and blown away and the person I was with that was driving me, she, she said, oh, this is so horrible, this is so terrible, and I'm going, well, let's get there and see. Because people get real excited about something like that that happens. And it can be worse or it can be better, but we'll see. So we got there and 
yeah, all of the big trees that we had in the front yard are gone. Oh, that's too bad. And the tornado had hit and it took my cabin and it lifted it up and moved it over about six inches and put it back down. <laughs> and it wasn't on the foundation anymore. So that was kind of a problem. And I had a, a, a roof in front of the cabin and that was gone. Okay, so there's there's some problems there. We had a a library, and it got blown over. And behind it, we had a walking uh, swimming pool, and it went into the swimming pool. And there were a, a number of problems that we had, but it wasn't that big a deal. So I went into my cabin expecting to see everything in my cabin all over the place and it was going to be a major hassle. And the only thing that I found was that I had a bookshelf and it fell. So there was books on the floor. I had a table that was about this size and I had three crystals, big, like this high and about that big around. Two of them were like that. One of them was quite a bit bigger. And they were still sitting on the table beside a glass of water. <laughs> it, <laughs> I mean, it didn't really cause that much problem inside. It's just that it picked up the cabin and moved it over and now we had to lift it back up and put it back on the foundation. So I didn't get excited about it. I was, yeah, we got a lot of work to do. We have to take all these trees that got blown down. Now we have to uh, clean them up and we got to do a whole bunch of stuff. And there were some cabins that one of the, one of the shingles on the roof blew off. So we had to put some of those back on. And, but it wasn't anything to get terribly excited about. Yeah, it was a problem, but okay, now we can have some fun whether we, while we're fixing it up. No problem. And we had, was it that time? No, we, th that was the second time we got hit by a tornado. The time before that, we had a lot of trees that, that blew down and uh, had to do a lot of work. And a guy from FEMA came and he said, oh, you've got so many problems and you have to do all of this stuff and you have to, uh, one building blew away which we were just getting ready to abandon because <laughs> we moved it up into another place. And he said, oh, you have, we had goats and we had chickens and ducks and we had a big turkey and other animals around. And he, he stopped and he looked at all of this and he said, well, you actually are a small farm. So I can help you with the finances of getting the place fixed up again. And they wrote a check right there for $22,000. And you know how much it cost to fix it up? About six. Yeah. So, those kind of things can happen, but I didn't get excited about it. I didn't worry about it. I mean, I, I was singing songs on the way home. <coughs> and the person that was driving me, oh, they were an, an emotional wreck. So what's there to be upset by? These kind of things happen. I live in the Midwest. There are 
tornadoes in the Midwest. You live here, you have earthquakes. Okay, what's the difference? It's going to hit sometime. Okay, fine. Then we'll just fix it back up and carry on. No biggie. So, you choose to be happy or sad. It's your choice. Again, one of the things that I truly love about Buddhism is you have responsibility for yourself. You have the responsibility of you can be happy or you can be sad. Even when a disaster hits, you can be happy or you can be sad. You, you, the more you develop this meditation, the more balance you have in your mind. And the more you're going to have that balance, even in a stressful situation, you're not going to get so emotionally upset. I've, I've been around people that died. It wasn't particularly a nice experience, but I was radiating equanimity with these people so their mind was accepting so that when they died, they had a peaceful, calm mind. I had something to do. I wasn't helpless. I'm never helpless. There's always something to do to help other people. And I don't have to touch them. I don't even have to be in the same room with them. But I can love them and I can radiate a balanced, accepting mind. When my mother died, she was a real special lady. She was the most compassionate person I've ever met. She ran a nursing home for 30 years. And anytime you go to that nursing home, when you drive in close and you park the car, you start feeling good because she demanded that everybody that worked there was happy. She demanded it, and they were. And because of that, they had fun helping people clean their bodies, feed, the, feed them food, take care of them, and laugh with them. She was real special. On the day she died, there was 12 or 15 relatives that were, she died at home. And uh, there was 12 or 15 people that came and they were all sitting around talking and, and some of them were spending a long time being sad. But as she got closer to death, I started radiating equanimity to everybody in the room. And I went and saw her every now and then, make sure everything was okay, but she was in a coma. Now it's a real interesting phenomena. When you're around somebody in a coma, they know you're there. They just can't react to you. If you put your hand on their, on their forehead and you quiet your mind and then you ask them a simple question, you will have mind-to-mind -mind contact with them. And they'll answer your question. How can I, what can I do? What can I, how can I help you? I really want some water. Okay. So I would go get some water. 
she just wanted a couple drops. Her mouth was dry. So she died. And all of the relatives that were there, they were brothers and sisters of hers and aunts and uncles of mine. And the the amazing thing was, even though they were sad, and she was a matriarch of the family, she took care of everybody in that family, she helped them in one way or another, and when she died, nobody was crying. Well, that's kind of interesting. After five or ten minutes, one of my relatives said, you know, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. I said, why would you laugh? Because now she's not suffering. I said, she didn't suffer. She had a great balanced mind, no problems. And she knew what was happening and she accepted that it was going to happen. She didn't fight it. And I said, after, after about 10 minutes, nobody cried. And I said, well, if you want to cry, now's the time to do it. You're not going to interfere with her passage of going from this life to the n another life. Now, they were, all of my family is very, very strong Christians. They really think I'm bizarre. <laughs> I shave my head, I walk around in robes, I travel all over the world. They don't know how I can do that, but they are continually uh, asking me about my travels, but they will never ask me anything about Buddhism. And right after my mother died, they started coming up to me in pairs and, and sometimes three people at a time, thanking me for being there. That was amazing. I didn't cry because my mother died. I'd been with her every day for six weeks. I spent a lot of time helping her, being with her, and reminding her of things when I grew up and what I appreciated about her and how much fun we had together. She was kind of a joker. and She, she would do things, you would think that she was a very proper lady, and then she'd pull some kind of joke on somebody, <laughs> and it was great. And I, I gave her those kind of memories. And she, she had some good laughs right before she died. The day that she died, I got up and I was in, in the morning and I walked up to her and I pinched her on the cheek like this. And I said, what makes you so cute? She said, I've always been this way. It's just taken you this long to see it. <laughs> and it's good. Really good stuff. Anyway. So. Okay, monk. Just as from the contact and friction of two fire sticks, heat is generated and fire is produced, with the separation and disjunction of those two fire sticks, the corresponding heat ceases and subsides. So to independence on the contact to be felt as pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. Uh, one understands with the cessation of that same contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant nor 
neither painful nor pleasant, its corresponding feeling ceases and subsides. When there's not contact, that feeling is not there anymore. That's pretty simple. Then there remains only equanimity, purified and bright, malleable, wieldy and radiant, Suppose, monk, a skilled goldsmith or his apprentice were to prepare a furnace, heat up a crucible, take some gold tongue, take some gold with tongs, and put it into the crucible. From time to time he would blow on it. From time to time he would sprinkle water over it. From time to time, he would just watch and look on. That gold would become refined, well refined, completely refined, faultless, without dross, malleable, wieldy, and radiant. Then, whatever kind of ornament he wishes to make, whether a golden chain or earrings or a necklace or a golden garland, it would serve his purpose. So too, monk, when there remains only equanimity, purified and bright, malleable, wieldy and radiant, he understands thus, if I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to loving kindness and the base of infinite or, or, excuse me compassion and the base of infinite space and to develop my mind accordingly then this equanimity of mind supported by that base craving and clinging to it would remain for a very long time. So you have the control of whether you want to stay with compassion with infinite space or not. I don't really allow you much time to do it. I push, <coughs> push you along. But when you get home, you can decide that what do I want to do with meditation now? After having the experiences of the Arupa Jhanas, you can take a day or a week or a month and just stay with that one Arupa Jhana. You can stay with loving kindness, you can stay with compassion, you can stay with joy, you can stay with equanimity. Just make a determination, that's what you want to do. So, it can stay for a long time, and you can get quite attached to it. But, I want to push you further than that, I want you to get off the wheel. And I'll help you to get off the wheel as long as you follow the directions the way that I'm showing you. If I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to joy and the base of infinite consciousness or with equanimity and the base of nothingness, or to the base of neither perception or non-perception and develop my mind accordingly, then this equanimity of mind supported by that base, craving and clinging to it, it would remain for a very long time. So, it depends on you and what you want to do with your meditation. And we'll talk more about this as we get closer to the end of the retreat. 
He understands thus, if I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of the compassion with the base of infinite space and to develop my mind accordingly, this would be conditioned. It's a conditioned state that you're in. Every jhana is a conditioned state. If I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to joy with the base of infinite consciousness or to with equanimity in the base of nothingness or to the base of neither perception or non-perception and to develop my mind accordingly, this would be conditioned. See, all of the jhanas are conditioned. They lead to the unconditioned if you follow what I'm showing you. He does not form any condition or generate any volitional tending towards either being or non-being since he does not form any condition or generate any volitional tending towards either being or non-being, he does not crave and cling to anything in the world. When he does not crave or cling anything, he is not agitated. When he's not agitated, he becomes personally attains Nibbana. Mm. Simple, right? He understands thus, birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. That means becoming an arahat. You become an arahat, I'll become your, your first student. Okay. If he feels a pleasant feeling, he understands it is impermanent. There's no holding to it. There's no delight in it. If he feels a painful feeling, he understands it is impermanent. There's no holding to it. There's no delight in it. If he feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands it is impermanent. There's no holding to it. There's no delight in it. If he feels a feeling, he feels it with a detached mind. If he feels a painful feeling, he feels it with a detached mind. Don't get caught in it. Don't make a big deal out of it. Don't try to control it. Don't try to change it or make it be the way you want it to be. Don't keep your attention on it. Relax, smile, come back to your object of meditation. If he feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he feels it with a detached mind. When he feels a feeling terminating with the body, he understands, I feel a feeling terminating with the body. When he feels a feeling terminating with life, he understands, I feel a feeling terminating with life. He understands on the dissolution of the body, with the ending of life, all that is felt, not being delighted in, will become cool right there. Cool. Nibbana. Cool. Ain't that cool? <laughs> Monk, just as an oil lamp burns in dependence on the oil and a wick, 
<coughs> and when that oil and wick are used up, if it does not get any more fuel, it is extinguished from lack of fuel. So too, when he feels a feeling terminating with the body or with life, he understands, I feel a feeling terminating with the body or with life. He understands on the dissolution of the body with the ending of life, all that is felt, not being delighted in, will become cool right away. Therefore, a monk possessing this wisdom possesses the supreme foundation of wisdom for this is the supreme noble wisdom namely the knowledge of the destruction of all suffering his deliverance becomes founded upon truth is unshakable for this, that is false, monk, which has a deceptive nature, and that is true, which has an undeceptive nature, Nibbana. Therefore, a monk possessing this truth possesses the supreme foundation of truth, for that for this monk is the supreme noble truth, namely Nibbana, which has an undeceptive nature. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he undertook and accepted acquisitions. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them, so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Therefore, a monk possessing this relinquishment possesses the supreme foundation of relinquishment letting go of craving. For this monk is the supreme noble relinquishment, namely the relinquishing of all acquisitions. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced covetousness, desire, and lust he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with them, so they are no longer subject to future arising. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced anger, ill will, and hate. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so they are no longer subject to future arising. Now, what we just went through was, I like it, I want it, lust. I don't like it, I don't want it, hatred. And the relinquishing of suffering, letting go of what? Craving and taking it personally. This is just another way of describing letting go of craving. <coughs> Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced ignorance and delusion. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them, so they are no longer subject to future arising. Therefore, a monk possessing this peace 
possesses the supreme foundation of peace. For this, monks, is the supreme noble peace, namely the pacification of lust, hatred, and delusion, the pacification of all craving. So it was with reference to this that it was said one could not neglect wisdom, should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, and should train for peace. The tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage at peace. So it was with reference <coughs> this is, wait a minute. So it was said and with reference to what was this said. Monk, I am is conceiving. I am this is conceiving. I shall be is conceiving. I shall not be is conceiving. I shall be possessed of form is conceiving. I shall be formless is a conceiving. I shall be radiant is conceiving. I shall be non-radiant is conceiving. I shall be neither radiant nor non-radiant is conceiving. Conceiving is a disease. Conceiving is a tumor. Conceiving is a dart. By overcome, overcoming all conceivings, a monk is called a sage at peace. And the sage at peace is not born, does not age, does not die. He is not shaken and does not yearn for anything. For there is nothing present in him by which he might be born. He has no more craving, no more attachments. Not being born, how could he age? Not aging, how could he die? Not dying, how could he be shaken? Not being shaken, how could he yearn for anything in the world? So it was with reference to this, it was said, the tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he's called a sage at peace. Monk, bear in mind this brief exposition on the six elements. This is a short discourse. Okay. When, he, when the Buddha gave discourses quite often, he would, because there's a lot of repeating in what he said, it might last all night. And the monks didn't go to sleep. They were real enthusiastic about it. They really liked his discourses. They learned a lot. Thereupon the venerable Pukusati thought, indeed the teacher has come to me. The sublime one has come to me. 
the fully awakened one has come to me. Then he rose from his seat, arranged his upper robe over one shoulder, <coughs> excuse me, and prostrating himself with his head at the Blessed One's feet, he said, Venerable Sir, a transgression overcame me in that like a fool, confused and blundering, I presumed to address the Blessed One as friend. Venerable Sir, may the Blessed One forgive my transgression, seen as such for the, fake, the sake of restraint in the future. Monks called themselves friends, but that was not respectful to do to the Buddha himself. You always would say reverend, sir. Surely, monk, a transgression overcame you that like a fool, confused and blundering, you presume to address me as friend. But since you see your transgression as such and make amends in accordance with the Dhamma, we forgive you. For it is growth in the noble one's discipline. When one sees one's uh, transgression as such and makes amends in accordance with the Dhamma and undertakes restraint in the future. Venerable Sir, I would receive the full admission under the Blessed One. But your bowl, are your bowl and robes complete? You have to have a set of three robes and bowl and some other small requisites. Venerable Sir, my bowl and robes are not complete. Monk Tathagatas do not give the full admission to anyone whose bowl and robes are not complete. Then the Venerable Pukusati, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's words, rose from his seat after paying homage to the Buddha he departed in order to search for a bowl and robes. Then, while well, the venerable Pukusati was searching for a bowl and robes, a stray bull killed him. Oh. Then a number of monks went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told, told, told him, Venerable Sir, the clansman Pukusati, who was given a brief instruction by the Blessed One, has died. What is his destination? What is his future course? Monks, the clansman Pukusati was wise. He practiced in accordance to the Dhamma and did not trouble me in the interpretation of the Dhamma. With the destruction of the five lower fetters, the clansman Pukusati has reappeared spontaneously in the pure abodes and will attain final Nibbana there without ever returning from that world. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Now that sounds kind of cold, what the, what he, the Buddha was talking about, but it's not. Pukusati, I've, I've read about him in a past lifetime, and uh, there was another, he was a monk, and there was another monk that really didn't like him very much. And he made a vow right before he died that he was gonna get even with Pukusati. And because of that hatred, that monk was reborn as a bull. 
and he did kill Pukusati. But because Pukusati had seen the Buddha and became an anagami, an anagami is someone they never have any doubt as to whether this is the right path or not. They know that rites and rituals don't lead to Nibbana. They come very, they become very intelligent and they see the impersonal nature of things very, very clearly. They never have any lust or hatred arise in their mind again. And that is what an anagami is. When they die from the human realm, they will be reborn in what is called the pure abodes. Um, some of the Mahayana, they, they like to talk about the pure lands and all of that sort of thing. That's misinterpretation of the pure abodes. Anyway, they will live there for a fairly long period of time. They will have a, a youthful body, but they, they will live for 15 or 20 Mahakapas in that realm. Now, Mahakapa is a long, long time. Uh, to explain a Mahakapa, I have to explain that the Mahakapa is broken up into four different, what they call Asankaya, and this is a long period of time. The Asankaya is the expansion of the universe, the stopping of the universe the contraction of the universe and the stopping from that. Now, they say um, Buddhist and numbers are not as accurate as they possibly could be, but this is what I saw from a commentary. An asankaya in human years is 10 with 160 zeros behind it. That's one asankaya. The only time, don't sit with your arms like that. The only time that there is life in the universe is when the universe is expanding, like it is right now. It's, it's going out. But eventually, it will stop. And all life in the universe will stop going. So you, they would be reborn, the people that were re, in this universe, they would be reborn in another universe. There are more than one universes. So it would stop for one asankaya, it would contract for one asankaya, and then it would stop for one asankaya. So that, those four different things, equal one Mahakapa. A Mahakapa is 10 with 560, yeah, 560 zeros behind it. That's one Mahakapa. When you are reborn as a, don't sit with your arms crossed, please. When you sit with, or when, when you are reborn in a Brahma Loka, I think the lowest one is 15 Mahakapas. But it might be 15,000, I'm not sure. I, I have to look up the numbers again. But it's a long time that they would be around. Now, he was reborn in the Brahma Loka. 
the Brahma Loka is a real interesting place. The thing that keeps your body alive, your nourishment is joy. Joy. If you're reborn in the Deva Loka, um, that means the the regular heavenly realms that uh, good people go to. Now they have to. Their nourishment is grapes, and they're always manifesting in front of them, and they're popping grapes all the time. And there's a lot of singing and dancing and enjoyment in those different realms. So, Pukusati was a very intelligent man. He understood what the Buddha was, see, was, was talking about without asking a lot of questions or troubling him by getting him to explain things in a little different way. That's why the Buddha praised him. So, anyway, why don't we share some merit? <coughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you.